You're listening to Answers for the Family with Alan Cardoza and Matt Polachek, only on L.A. Talk Radio. Welcome to another edition of Answers for the Family. I'm your host, Alan Cardoza, and my co-host, Dr. Matt Polachek, he is helping clients again this morning, but I spoke to him, and he will be back next week, which is something I'm looking forward to. For those of you that have been listening, sending in questions, sending in comments, and telling your friends, thank you so much. And please continue to help spread the word that every Monday from 11 a.m. to noon Pacific time, this show will bring you special guests that can inspire, educate, and in some cases, entertain while bringing answers and options to making your lives happier, healthier, and more successful. Now, this show will address issues such as locating a runaway teen, family crisis intervention, building self-esteem, dealing with addictions, and so much more. We'll introduce you to talented authors and new innovations in the areas of health, security, and fun for you and your family. Now, in his first book, The Practicing Mind, our guest set out clear guidelines for developing focus and discipline to achieve any life goal. As he traveled and spoke about the book, he kept track of the questions readers and participants at his seminars asked. The exploration of those questions became the basis of his latest book, Fully Engaged, Using the Practicing Mind in Daily Life. So our guest today, Thomas Sterner, is the founder and CEO of the Practicing Mind Institute. And he's a popular and in-demand speaker who works with high-profile individuals, including athletes, industry groups, and individuals, helping them operate effectively within high-stress situations so that they can break through to new levels of mastery. As an expert, present moment functioning coach, Tom has brought clarity to thousands regarding how they can accomplish more with less effort in the least amount of time and with greatly reduced stress. So, Tom, my question is, where have you been all my life? <laughs> <laughs> so, but, and I got to, for everybody out there, I mean, top media outlets such as NPR, Fox News, and Forbes uh, have all sought out Tom's advice. Now, in his downtime, Tom is an accomplished musician, a private pilot, an avid sailor, and a golfer. And he lives in Wilmington, Delaware, and enjoys spending time with his two daughters and in his recording studio. So, Tom, thank you for taking the time for us, and welcome to Answers for the Family. Oh, what a pleasure, Alan. Thank you for having me. It's great. Now, the I, I love the title of the new book, which is Fully Engaged. So... Tell us a little bit about what what was your meaning when you decided this is going to be the, the name of the book and and how was this going to to be this great companion to the practicing mind? Well, initially, when I wrote the practicing mind, I couldn't have imagined the success it would have. I really couldn't. Uh, I you know had not never written a book and put it out there before. And I self-published The Practicing Mind um, at, at first, and then it got picked up by New World Library. And um, so I was really intimidated to write a second book, well, at least on the same topic, you know, because I thought I could just hear the reviews, you know, wow, this is okay. But the first book was a lot better. So I, I thought this is uh, kind of a scary undertaking. And as you said in the introduction, it wasn't until I had been out in public uh, being uh, speaking under all different circumstances and on doing one-on-one -on -one coaching that uh, I started to see this pattern of questioning uh, from people who had read The Practicing Mind. So then I, I began to feel like I had the content, and that was where the, when I decided I would write Fully Engaged. But, you know, we're finding that um, through our exposure to constant digital media, our heads always being stuck in a, a smartphone or uh, an iPad or whatever, you know, our ability to focus for any length of time to pay attention is really diminishing. And this is a real concern for, it's a concern for, um, you know, for middle-aged people, but even a bigger concern for young people because they're starting from this point, whereas the people that are, say, above 40 years old, you know, they came f from a time when 
which includes me, of course, they came from a time where, you know, television had three channels and you, you, there were no video games and no cell phones and all that. So, you know, we had a lot of downtime. We had a lot of quiet time where we just played outside and our imagination was allowed to develop. Now all of that's done for you and there's this constant um, input into the mind. The media has contact and connection to us 24-7, and which is what they want. So our mind is always being stimulated, and that's a problem anyway. Our mind is a thought machine, and it, it, it wants to think and, and solve problems and chew on bones and that sort of thing. So it doesn't want to stand still anyway. And all it needs is this stimulation to ramp things up even farther. So we really are not fully engaged in um, almost all of our life. Uh, our mind is always running around but we it feels normal to us because it's what we um it's how we live and that's really where the idea of writing a book called fully engaged and then adding some new things and incorporating all the concepts that i talked about in the practicing mind that's where it all came from well and and you bring up a great point uh when you said that it's what we've become accustomed to because i know that there are times in which when i discuss the different things that i do and people will say oh my god how how do you do all of those things and i go i don't know how not to i mean it you know it's 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 what i started to do it became part of my life so how do we set some of these things aside and sort of retrain our brain to focus on those things that are most important Well, the very first thing you have to do, and it's the core fundamental building block of everything we'll talk about today, is you have to develop what I'll call thought awareness. You have to understand and experience the fact that you are not your thought. You are not your thoughts. Your mind produces thoughts. You're the one that experiences your thoughts. And many of the thoughts that we have during the day, we... Um, we create to intention, but most of the thoughts are just our mind ruminating through things that have happened or anxieties based on the future, like what if this happens? And it, like as I said, it's it's a, a thought machine, and if you don't give it something to solve, it will go looking for something. It'll just go into search mode. So we have to be able to separate ourselves from that because what you were just describing there is, you know, you don't know, um, you know, how, what you said. How do we change this? Well, you can't change what you're not aware of. So most of the time people spend their day in their thoughts. There's a very big difference between noticing your thoughts and being uh, an observer of your thoughts and just being in your thoughts. When you're in your thoughts, you're just experiencing the emotional content of the thought and you're really not aware that you are separate from that whole experience. And you can, you know, when you have that separation, then you give yourself this privilege of choice where you can say, you know, that thought, I know where that thought is going to take me and it's not going to serve my happiness it's not going to serve my productivity so i'm going to make the choice here to not go in that direction now i'm not saying that that's always easy <laughs> but but it, it the thing is that um if you have the choice then you at least have the opportunity mm-hmm. to execute a plan so and how do we do that well you know we, we do it by um you can call the word meditation you know that's a subject that it's a label for a process it has a lot of different meanings to different people but in the context of what we're talking about here today. It's simply a, a, um, a, a system of sitting down quietly in a room where you're not going to be um, interrupted for maybe 10 minutes a day and sitting there and just watching your body breathe or mentally repeating a very short phrase like, I am still. It's Really, the words don't matter so much. It should be something that you find comforting, not something that brings anxiety like, I owe taxes, <laughs> but it should be something like, like that. And what will happen very quickly, if you've never tried this before, mm-hmm. is that it sounds, the mechanics of it sound so easy. Oh, I just sit in a chair and I watch my body breathe. Well, if you're using the breath one, what will happen is you will almost immediately try to control your breath because you will say, because you've never paid attention to your breathing before, you, it's your body just breathes. But when you start paying attention to it, you start thinking, you know, I don't think I'm breathing deep enough. I think I need to breathe deeper. I think that'll relax you more. And this, all this dialogue starts to happen and you start kind of control. And that's a very normal response and you have to resist that. If you're using um, that or the uh, the phrase base, what will happen is 
uh, within about 30 seconds, your mind will just steal away. And because you've always gone with it, you will, you will go along. And at some point you will, what I'll call wake up and you'll realize that you're really not paying attention to your breath anymore, that you're thinking about something that's going to happen later on today or something that happened, you know, last week or, um, something you have to do all these things. Because like I said, the mind gets very uh, bored with this and it doesn't like being in control. So it takes off and you follow it. And it's in that moment, it's in that microsecond that everything happens. People tend to get down on themselves because they feel like, I'm not very good at this because I'm always chasing my mind. I can't stay focused. My mind's always running off. Well, in that moment when you notice that you, your mind has taken off and that you've gone with it, that's when the personal expansion happens because that's when your awareness starts to, to grow of, I'm not my thoughts. I'm directing my mind to not think about anything but this my breath or my phrase and it's doing it's going off on its own even though i am not giving a permission to do that it's doing it on its own and for many people it's the first time in their life that they realize that their mind's doing stuff all day long that they're not even aware of and they're experiencing all this emotional content and they're just they're not even giving themselves an opportunity to change that so i what i tell people is in that moment when you wake up and you realize that two things have happened one is your awareness has grown and two your discipline grows because you pull your mind back into the this thing and that's it that's the whole thing is you do that for 10 minutes some days your mind is going to be very agitated and be running around a lot and you're going to feel like you didn't get any still time in your 10 minutes all you did was chase your mind that's not a bad thing it's like going to the gym and getting a lot of repetitions in i mean <laughs> every time you catch it and you bring it back you're growing you're expanding and what you're after is happening there's other times there's going to be times when you're more relaxed for whatever's going on in your life and you'll feel like you know I'm really getting this because I'm not chasing my mind. I'm really seem to be able to pay attention to this for longer periods of time. They're both normal. They both happen for everybody, even people. I've meditated for 40 years, and I still have days where I feel like I'm, all I'm doing is chasing. The difference is that I don't judge it. I just accept that this is where my mind is this day. It's very agitated, and uh, I, I'm not surprised that it, it has this need to go problem solve. But... Because I don't judge it, um, my experience is always the same. And how this will translate into your daily life is you will begin to notice that you're ahead of what's going on around you. There will be stressful stuff happening. And instead of you feeling this immediate stress, you will notice that these situations create stressful thoughts. It's, an, it's really an amazing experience. And all of a sudden, you start to feel this inner calm, and you, you feel in control of the situation because you feel like you have this choice. And making the choice will get easier and easier. And more difficult situations, and initially, you may notice it was more simple situations that uh, don't take a whole lot of uh, internal stamina. But as time goes by, you'll find that situations that used to really stress you out, you're in control of them, and you can make a choice of how you're going to experience them. It's, it's so mm -hmm. powerful. It's free. It's easy to do. And there's been so much documentation on it. Uh, we know that this works. It's been around for thousands of years, but it's been proven out through empirical studies in the West here over the last, I don't know, three or four decades. So it's something that children, everybody needs to bring it into their life. Now, as we're talking about stress and anxiety, uh, I walk my dogs every morning, so uh, I, and I see the same people every morning. We walk out. It's a beautiful park. It has eucalyptus trees. It has squirrels, which kind of goes to that whole change of focus thing because the dogs see squirrel, and then now they're not listening to me. But um, I'm talking with a friend, and he is he's talking about he has a new job, and he's he's feeling a lot of stress, and he's feeling a lot of anxiety in regards to it. And it, this started from from him asking who's going to be on the show today and then I told him that you know you were going to be on the show and what we were going to talk about and that got him talking about his own stress and anxiety now what he did was he called his doctor his doctor immediately put him on Adderall so talk a little bit about what apparently western medicine is deciding is the answer to these things as opposed to what we're talking about today well, Western, um, the Western medicine is driven by the pharmaceutical companies. I mean, I think pretty exactly. much everybody notices that. It's, you know, it's amusing and at the same time um, perplexing and upsetting when you watch these drug commercials and they say, you know, if you're depressed, take this medicine. Um, 
uh, to help your depression, but if it makes you feel like killing yourself, call your doctor. I mean, I, right. I, I look at that and I think, how does that get get passed somewhere? Or there's another one that it's supposed to, um, they're, they're so crafted. I mean, they, it shows the, the these images are happening up on the top of buildings and in the sky. And the subliminal message there is like, this is coming from a supreme being. And everybody's stopping what they're doing and looking up at this. And it's like, this, this pharmaceutical helps uh, your immune system work more efficiently and overcome cancer, uh, you know, and these these um, you know these ailments that you're dealing with. But then, if you, there's always a, a, a happy story going on to distract you from the, what they're really saying. And then it goes on to say that you know, but a side effect of this is that it may attack your immune system and your organs even after you stop taking it. Um, because if you notice that this is creating a problem, you go stop taking it, it can continue to do this. And I, I watch that and I think, you know, this is, like I said, on the one hand, this is, this is really crazy, it's, but it's out there, you know. And yeah. so this, is, this stuff is so toxic and we're taught, <laughs> excuse me, that, you know, we have no control over this. Uh, we're just, our body's a machine. It breaks like a car and we need to put a new part in it or we need to take this thing here and that's going to fix it. That We really have no control over it. But if you read uh, books like uh, Bruce Lipton's Biology of Belief, you know, he says that we have known that things like heredity are really, um, they don't exist. Like just because your, your mother and your father may have had Alzheimer's does not mean that you're going to get Alzheimer's. You have a choice. There's all this stuff that they've known that it's the envir our environment and how we process our environment are what turns these things on and off uh, and that we have tremendous control over our health. But we're not taught this in our culture um, because it's not profitable. And, but, and uh, I was going to say, and I couldn't agree more, and when you talk about the heredity thing, it drives me crazy when I listen to somebody that continually says, you know, I'm going to end up with this because my parents had this. And they'll say it and I'll say, you know, if you keep telling yourself that long enough, you probably will. Stop it. You know, just stop telling yourself that. But yeah, it, it drives me crazy as well. Well, that's another example Alan, of where you can't stop that if you're not separate from that thought. You're having that thought and, it, you know, like you're like you and the, the relationship between you and that person is like the relationship of somebody who is more observer or noticer oriented. Well, you just that in that particular circumstance, you're the observer. You're saying to the person, if you keep doing that, what you're doing is you're programming yourself to make that happen. What we really want to accomplish is for the person themselves to be able to reprogram that, to notice, you know, I'm having these thoughts. These thoughts are not serving me and they're not where I want to go. So I'm going to stop those thoughts and then start creating these thoughts over here. Yeah. So um, are we looking at things like uh, uh, habits? And I know that, you know, and, and I use the example of, of thinking about our brain as a uh, as a snow capped mountain. And if we keep going down the same path over and over again, we make grooves in it and that becomes where we continually go. Is it something like that to where we've conditioned our brain by using that same path over and over again? And if so, how long does it take to now make new paths? Well, that's a great point, and I, I think it's. I think we should also point out that why do we? Why does our? Why do we have habits? I mean, why do we create habits? Any, you know, and the reason is because, well, at least what the research shows is that, from the brain's perspective, a habit is very processor efficient. You know, um, when the brain sees you doing something over and over again, and we're not talking about just a golf swing, you know, where you're taking the club away in the wrong direction. It, we're talking about behaviors, you know, the way you react to a certain situation. When the brain sees that over and over again, it, it says, oh, well, look, I can make this into a... Um, I can make this into a habit, and then it goes on automatic. And that's the problem with habits is there's no conscious choice making that goes on in a habit. It's just executed. It just, you know, it just pulls a pin and it fires it off. And that's the reason why the brain does it. And if you think about it, you know, anytime you're learning something new or you're trying to change a behavior, it takes all of your attention, which means it takes an enormous amount of processing in the brain to change that or to create this new system of thought or new motion in a golf swing. But after it learns it, it drops it into the background and then it can go now all this processor is freed up it's like ram on a computer mm -hmm. so um you know when we understand that then we can realize that this is the way we're built and it makes a lot of sense because if we had to think use all of our process 
uh, in our brain every time we walked across the room or we were feeding ourselves or all this, you know, we couldn't function. So this, it's not a bad thing, but I think we need to understand that, okay, if I'm, if I'm repeating this over and over again, it's like you said, you're creating this groove in the mountain and now you've got to get out of that. And so I, what I tell people in terms of changing hab- habits, repeat and relax. You know, anything you repeat for a certain length of time, there, there's been studies and not everybody's in agreement on it. And it probably depends a little bit on the personality. I know in the golf swing, uh, like a physical action, they have said, you know, if you do something um, like it was like 60 times a day for 21 days, it will be a new habit. And like if you're trying to change something in your golf swing. So they were saying, uh, okay, so look, if you need to change, take the club away this way instead of that way, then you do this 60 times a day. And in 21 days, this new way will feel normal and the old way will feel, um, will feel uncomfortable. But the mind works in the same way. So I think what I, what, what I want people to understand is stop judging. If you can just realize that when you decide I need to change this behavior, I need to change the way that I react to this situation. First of all, you need a plan. You need to know how am I going to, wh- what is the habit that I want to create and how, you know, what are the components to that? And then you have to uh, repeat those components you know, over a period of time, and then that will feel normal to you and it will feel comfortable. And this is one of the reasons why I feel it's it's important to have um, a mentor, a coach, or whatever, observing your behavior as you move through these things. And the reason for that is is because there might be something that you want to change that you only confront once a week, once every two weeks, once a month. So you have to go through so many repetitions of that in order to execute your plan of, okay, this is what I want to do. So if you were doing it with golf, you know, you got to be on the golf course or you got to be at the driving range. Uh, so it's important for people to understand that you need so many repetitions of going through this particular scenario in order for you to execute your plan. And you shouldn't expect to execute it one time and for it to be a habit. And it's kind of nice when you have somebody that's watching that and can review that with you and show you the wake behind the boat because I think that's where people get lost as they go you know I need to change there's this person at work that really bothers me and you know how am I going to change that well if you only see the people the person every two weeks uh, it's going to take you a while because you need the opportunity to come up with a plan and then you need to execute that plan you need that person getting in your face so that you can execute this plan but it happens pretty quickly but I think that that's an important point to realize now, you, you, what you sounds like you're talking about is a little bit about the, the premeditated procedures that you talk about in the book. Share with us a little bit about what the premeditated procedures are and, and how they can help, help us become less stressed. Well, we know that premeditated procedures work very well. I mean, as a pilot, I can tell you that pretty much everything you do is a premeditated procedure. And there's a procedure when you walk up to the airplane, when you first get to the airport, to walk around the airplane and look for specific things. They're all things that you start out with them being written down. And then you memorize them over a period of time so you don't need an actual written checklist. But but when you get in the airplane and you start pre-flighting it for, um, to make sure that it's safe to fly, that you actually have a, a, a written down list that you put your finger on every time as you go down the list. And not with my instructors, they would make me physically touch the gauge with my finger instead of just look at it. Because they said, you know, you can tend to look at it and see what you want to see. If you touch it, you have to really fully engage with the process of going through the checklist. So, I, you know, a procedure to me is understanding, I, I ask myself, Uh, If I'm going to be confronted by a certain situation that I feel is going to be a little bit of a struggle, I ask myself, if I could behave any way that I wanted in this situation, what would that be? That's the first thing I do is I make that decision. Because if you don't know that before you get into the situation, it's almost impossible to figure it out once you're in the situation. Because then there's too much emotional content and you're just reacting to the situation. It's pretty hard to pull yourself out and separate yourself if you haven't done that first. So first you make a decision. How do I want to behave in this circumstance if I could behave any way I want? Now, once you know that, then you can begin to set up some uh, things that you can drop into when you're in the situation. It's amazing how powerful this is because what it does is it really separates you from the situation and you become more 
of the observer. So let's take uh, the situation there that I wrote about in, in Fully Engaged where, you know, I had, as I was a concert piano technician for many years and I had a, uh, a concert pianist who was, uh, could be a very difficult person. He had some alcohol problems and he could just be, uh, really go off. And I had had an experience with him a few years before that where he had become irrational uh, on stage and I got the brunt of it. And, uh, so anyway, he w he came into town. He was supposed to work on uh, play on this piano. It was a solo performance, which meant that he was going to be on the piano. It was just him and the piano on the stage, and then this, this theater would be full of people. And the piano was uh, stored under the stage. It was cacophonious. It was it needed a lot of work. And I was supposed to come in at around ten o'clock and work on the instrument for most of the day. And then he was supposed to come in at five o'clock and sit down and play it after I had prepared it. That didn't happen. He came to the theater early in the morning because he was bored and he somebody let him in he got on the piano and he was just absolutely out of control livid he was calling me names your piano technician's a jerk he doesn't know what he's doing etc and the poor stagehand didn't know how to handle it so he called me at home and said can you come in here and, and deal with this situation and i said yeah just tell him i'm on my way my first reaction to that alan initially was um I was annoyed that somebody had let this guy in. I thought, now mm -hmm. I am way down in a rabbit hole that I got to climb out of with this guy. He's going to, he hates me already. He hates the piano and I've got to turn that around. But I very quickly saw it as an opportunity because I said, okay, this is where I'm at. Uh, I know what I'm going to be confronted with. If I could behave any way in this situation, what would that be? Well, I knew I couldn't control his reaction, but I could control mine. So I, I decided, you know, that I was going to take this um, from a, a position of being very compassionate and understanding of why he was experiencing what he was experiencing. And I wasn't going to let him touch my inner peace. I was going to, I expected him to be mad. I expected him to insult me. I expected all that. So I knew when I went in there that I was, was going to have that. So when it would happen, I wouldn't be taken off guard. So I get in there and I get on the piano and here he comes through the door and he was pretty much predictable. I mean, he had fire coming out of his eyes. He was really angry. So I, I, I thought, well, I'm just going to strike the first blow. So what I said was, I, I stood up, I introduced myself, and I said, I'm, you know, really very sorry that you had uh, somebody of your caliber had to tolerate an instrument in this condition. This was the original plan. This is why the piano is where it's at, and I really understand that you are going to be out there in front of those people tonight by yourself and nobody out there is going to know what condition this piano is in. And if it doesn't function as an interface that serves all the years that you have worked to, um, to interpret this music, you're going to get criticized for that. Not, and if they're not going to blame the piano, they're going to blame you. And we don't want that to happen. Well, as I'm talking to him, I think maybe for the first time he realized that Number one, I wasn't a jerk. Number mm -hmm. two, I really cared about what he, why he was feeling so fearful and upset. And I could, as I was talking to him, I could see his face soften, his shoulders drop, everything just changed. And then um, he interrupted me and he said, "What, you know, what did you say your name was?" And I said, it, "It's Tom Sterner." And he said, um, "Tom, I am really confident." in your ability to work on this piano. I'm going to go downstairs in the dressing room and just hang out. He said, just let me know when it's done. And I said, okay. So then I worked on the piano, and a couple hours later I went down, and he was down there reading, and I said, you know, would you like to come up and play the piano? I said, because we still have a couple hours left. And I said, I'm... Hap I'm yours for the day. I said, I will stay here as long as I have to and be in your back pocket and do whatever I need to do to make the piano acceptable to you. And he said, it's not necessary. He said, I'm really comfortable with you. And so he said, you know, you probably have better things to do. It was a Saturday. He said on a Saturday afternoon. So, you know, why don't you go on home? And so I did. And he had a brilliant performance, everything. So everybody won there. That situation could have erupted into all sorts of problems. I could have gotten in a screaming match with him and then he would have it would have ruined my weekend for sure it, mm -hmm. he would have carried it into the performance and he would have had a terrible performance the people would have been upset because they paid money for a lousy performance all these things were avoided simply because i had this conversation with myself in this moment because i was aware i had this self-awareness that this is where this thought process this annoyance is going to take me where do i want to go I, I was i could have that choice and you know the side story to that was i met him several years later at another venue 
And when I walked in, he came out of the wings and he remembered me. And he said, he said, I am so relieved, Tom. It's you on the piano. He said, this thing needs work. He said, I can go back to the hotel and relax. He said, you know, I hope you can make it to the show. I'd love, uh, love for you to be there. So we end up being almost friends, you know, yeah. like, a, but like I said, there's a situation that, like I said, it was so volatile. But just by um, being aware of my thoughts and where they were taking me, having that opportunity to make a choice and then to make a premeditated plan. I know what the situation is going to be like. I know I'm going to have these impulses that are going to be banging at the door, but I'm not going to answer them. I, this is going to be my plan. This is going to be the plan that I execute. And going back to what I said a few minutes ago, you, in order to get good at that, you've got to be in that situation. At, now and there, after that situation, I was always ready for that situation. Whenever I got in a situation like that in a concert um, circumstance, I could always just drop back to that. I knew mm -hmm. that that worked, and so it became my savior. So these are the types of things that, you know, if you can just learn these concepts and then practice them, uh, it, it really does change your life. Yeah, and I, I couldn't agree more. And, and like you said, you could have gone into that and focused on the first thing was, okay, who was the idiot that let him in to begin with? And then go from there. And then it just seems to all of a sudden, you know, everything's snowballing in the wrong direction. So yeah, I absolutely love the way you handled it. Now for everybody out there, we're going to take a break. Uh, but be right back. We're talking with Tom Sterner, the author of The Practicing Mind and Fully Engaged. We'll be right back. Founded over 25 years ago to meet the needs of families in crisis, West Shield specializes in resolving adolescent issues that negatively impact the family. From preteen to young adult, we are experienced and qualified to help. We offer solutions which include referrals to a network of top professionals internationally that we work very closely with in the fields of educational consulting, psychology, and psychiatry. Our in-home crisis intervention care program helps to stabilize families and bring effective resolution. We are supported by our licensed investigation company that enables us to offer legal and expert services for locating runaway teens and more. Our therapeutic transportation services help to ensure that adolescents in crisis are safely provided transportation to specialized schools and programs with unmatched experience and success. Simply put, West Shield Adolescent Services is the best solution when your family is facing personal crisis. Call 1-800-899-8585 and let us help you. And we're back. We're talking with Tom Sterner and we are talking about being fully engaged. Now, Tom, we've got a question that's coming that's coming in from one of our listeners. And again, I want to thank everybody that takes the time to send us in a message, be it uh, the night before, be it early this morning or during the show. This one reads, with all the gadgets, systems and protocols that are supposed to organize our lives, why is it that I feel despair about having my life together? I run a small company that employs 30 people and I feel sometimes like I am running in place with no inner peace or purpose. And I'm not alone. So many of my friends feel the same way. Would your book give me some guidance? Thanks so much from John in Atlanta. Oh, absolutely. I think it would. And I don't really want to pitch the book. I think that the um, it's really that uh, what people have told me that have read The Practicing Mind uh, and then moved on to Fully Engaged is that uh, it's stuff that they've tried to figure out or they've been they've even people that have looked into mindfulness and all that sort of thing. And they said it's just the way that it's communicated that made them understand it for the first time. But what he's describing is uh, is very common and as i said earlier you know the media is tapped into us 24 7 so we're constantly fed this feeling of we're incomplete and we need to be someplace other than where we are we need to have something that we don't have and that is um you know that feeling in in many ways is a really i Personally, I feel that we're supposed to have that feeling. It's, a, it's part of our DNA because if we didn't have it, we would still be living in caves. If you look at all of the artwork that's, you know, the Sistine Chapel, if you look at even in the technology that in many times is the bane of our happiness, but it is incredible technology, the fact that we can have this conversation here and anybody anywhere in the world can listen to it is pretty cool. And it, it really does offer um, a lot of good things. But the... Um, 
all of those things have come from this inner sense that is within us that I can be more, I can do more. And when we begin to understand that, that it's not a bad thing. I mean, what we do, if you just look at the way your life is put together, uh, I talk, when I do, I've worked with young kids and I say, you know, what do you do with a video game uh, when you master it? They, they, in unison, they go, I get rid of it and get another one. I said, well, why do you think that is? I said, it's because you get bored when something is easy. We love the process of mastering anything. And when we once we get to where it's easy for us, we move on to the next thing. We just misinterpret the situation. Like what he's describing is he's up against a threshold. And what that threshold is, in my mind, is learning to deal with what he has to deal with during the day. And he can't learn to do that if he's not there. So it really is an opportunity. And when I tell people, when you feel that, when you feel I'm struggling, it's because you're up against something that you haven't mastered. The things that you're good at, you don't think about because you just do them effortlessly. When you're, you're in a, a situation where you can learn, like if I said, okay, Okay, well, if you could go through your day running your business and, um, you know, how would you, if you could experience it any way you would want, what would that be? Well, everybody would say, well, I would want, no, the, no matter how difficult things got, no matter how stressful they got, I would want it to be effortless for me. I would want it to just sail right through it. Well, that's right. That's the way we'd all want to be. But how do you get sure. to that place? You have to experience it. You have to be, if you want to sing in front of a thousand people, you got to, you got to get on the stage and sing in front of a thousand people. You can stand in the, your room and sing, and sing to your mirror all you want, but you have to be in that situation. And when you can shift that feeling of this is an opportunity for me to learn, I don't expect to be good at it um, all in one time. I expect, I'm gathering data. That's what I'm doing. That's when you master anything, you're gathering data. I'm gathering data and I'm gathering experience. And this is my opportunity to do that. So I'm going to stop judging how I'm handling this and say, I should be better at this. I should feel happy about this. No, some things are stressful. And, you know, we, what we want to do is really learn how to deal with the stress instead of, we, we tend to feel stressed and then we judge ourselves for feeling stressful. So we add another layer onto it. So I, um, I just, I wish I could talk to them, you know, because it's, that's when you really get, you, you get to talk to the people and that's when you really get an opportunity to, um, to communicate because they can tell you personally, well, what are you feeling in this particular, give me an example of how you experience your day. Well, you get up in the morning and that's usually the first thing I do when I work with people is it, to, it, describe a day for me, you know, and I, it's really kind of amazing after you work with them you know, for four or five weeks, they start to see what I hear is, you know, I'm going, I'm in the same job. I'm going through the same thing every day now that I did five weeks ago, but my experience of it is completely different. And it's, it was always there. It's just a matter of perspective and changing the way you approach things. Mm -hmm. Now, I, I, you know, that made me think when you said that you'd love to talk to him. And I just want to share for everybody out there is, is that I've been to Tom's website. And if you go to thomassterner.com, and again, if you're driving, don't try to write that down. Uh, it'll be on our site as well. Uh, but if you just go to thomassterner.com, um, you know, there you can ask the questions there. You can get into a little more uh, of this information. Uh, in fact, um, and I was going to bring up a little later, but I'll bring it up now. Um, share with us a little bit about your mastermind class, because I was looking at that and I thought, wow, I think this is talking to me. So, <laughs> uh, <laughs> Well, I think it's, it's actually Tom Sterner, not Thomas. It's just T-O-M-S-D-E-R. So it's TomSterner.com. Um, you probably would find that if you, if you typed in Thomas. I only use Thomas with the title of the book and uh, that's the reason because the reason that I like googled at one time and I found that you know under Thomas Sterner there's everybody from criminals to whatever and I thought well I think I'll stay away from uh, <laughs> or, I'm sorry Tom Sterner I just did Tom Sterner and I came up with you know guys that were in prison from DUI homicide and stuff and I thought I think I'll go with Thomas M. Sterner for you know the publication stuff but anyway um, what I decided to do uh, as a out of gratitude um, for all the success that the book has had was to create uh, uh, like a class, a mass, an online class mastermind. And the way that it works is, you know, you sign up for this and we meet once a week. I'm keeping the class size to under 10. And then what happens is, uh, and plus you get one full hour with me individually. And then for five weeks, every week, your group meets and we have this discussion and everybody brings one thing. I tell people, look, this is part of the practicing mind, you know, breaking things down to simplify them into small segments and working on the small segments for a short amount of time because it increases your focus. But I just say, bring one scenario that you want to apply the practicing mind to. And 
it's great because what happens is, is, you know, you might get somebody in the class that wants to apply it to the stress of investing. And then you get somebody else that wants to apply it to weight watching. Well, as we're all talking and I'm coaching the different people, the guy that's there for investment gets to hear how you deal with weight, weight, weight loss. And so everybody gets something from everybody else. And, and what I find is, you know, everybody um, gets to talk with each other too. And it really, it's really a fun hour and people learn a lot and then they get a recording of it. So they don't have to sit there and write notes frantically because they can listen to the, um, uh, they can go back and review it later. So everybody gets, it's a relaxing hour. And uh, like I said, everybody learns from everybody. And I just coach into, individual people. But that's the reason why I try to keep the class size down, because if you get too many people in there, then not everybody gets a chance to talk. So that's going on. Now, the downside is that, you know, we've, the registration has been up now for uh, about three weeks, and the end of this week is going to be the end of the registration. So if somebody wants to sign up, they really have to get on that. Uh, I might run it another time, uh, but right now, uh, that's, that's the way it is, because I had to plan in my schedule. I've got a lot of things going on in, in May and June. I've got a daughter getting married. I've got another daughter graduating with a master's, and I'm going to be on the road a lot and that sort of thing. So I wanted to get this in before all that happened. Got it. That makes perfect sense. So, and, and again, as I was reading the book, I was going through a lot of different things, and and I like triggers. I like things that, that become sort of a, a mantra of sorts. And so share with us a little bit about the and then what mantra and how it can help us uh, to be more fully engaged. Well, and then what is something that I always use when I start to feel um, I'm not in the present moment. Like I'm really attached to the goal. I'm attached to the product. I'm attached to the moment when I cross the finish line. And that's a feeling again that we're we, it's normal we're being uh, we want to feel that we want to be driven if we don't have motive that, that's our motivation but when we misuse it it creates a sense of uncomfortable most of struggle and impatience and and uh, that sort of a feeling which uh, um diminishes our ability to perform so one of the things i do to stop that when i feel myself feeling very attached to the moment that I uh, achieve whatever it is that I'm working on, I ask myself, and then what? I, I envision in my mind, okay, now I have that job. Now I have that car. Now I have whatever it is. Now I can play that piece of music. And then what? Am I going to feel fully realized? Am I going to, for the rest of my life? If, you know, is everything going to be perfect for the rest of my life? Or am, now that I have that, am I going to set another goal? And the answer is always, you're going to set another goal. If you look back through your life, you've been doing this, you've been going through this cycle from the time you were a child. You know, you just wanted that bike, you just wanted the cell phone, you just wanted that prom dress, whatever it is. You know, you just wanted a date with that person over there. There's, that's what moves us forward. And we get so wrapped up in that feeling. And if we could, if we can tell ourselves, okay, now I have it, and then what? It brings us back to realize that, you know, this is just the process that I love being in. I love this feeling of I'm accomplishing this, I'm running this race, I'm going to have this happen. Um, and you can let go of the moment that you cross the finish line. You know, why does it feel so good when you cross the finish line? I mean, it only takes a second. Uh, mm -hmm. It's because of everything that went on before that. You know, it's the training, it's the discipline, it's you know, it's the organization, it's the commitment, and it's the process of running the race. That's where all the joy is because you're really realizing that this is this is why crossing the finish line feels so wonderful. But yet we put ourselves at war with that. You know, because we feel like I just got to get to the finish line and uh if i draw a piece of if i take a piece of chalk and draw a line on the street and say there it is there's the finish line you're standing i go go ahead and step over it it means nothing it absolutely means nothing it's it is the process of achieving our goals whatever they are whether it's personal change behavior change a new job being good at interviews whatever it is that's where the joy is and if we can learn to just use the goal as a rudder to steer our efforts because if you don't have you know, I mean we need a goal that's uh, sure. the goals are what tell us this is what I want. This is where I want to go. This is where I want to be. That's like I said. That's our motivation. Without that, I've always said, you know, as a sailor, we're a sailboat without a rudder. I mean, the wind is there providing the energy, but we are just kind of you know meandering around in the bay. And you know, there's a saying, and for sailors is that once you leave the marina, you've reached your destination. Because sailors. Unlike a powerboat, in a sailor, you pick a destination to sail to so you can have the experience of sailing. That's why it's such a great metaphor. You, know, you, want, to, you want to work the boat. You want to be challenged by the wind. Sometimes the wind's blowing. Sometimes it's not. Sometimes the tide's against you. It's all 
all of those things. It's being able to manipulate the boat and deal with everything that you have that's always changing to get to the destination. And so it's a process uh, that you look forward to. And I think it's a great metaphor for what we're talking about. Yeah, and I think it's like most things that it's the challenge. You know, it's, it's the challenge that excites us more than just the completion. I know I, I have a foster brother who who runs these incredibly long races like he did like a double deca um iron man you know there was 20 iron man competitions back to back and what he was so proud of and we watched him do it online and was he said i was one of eight people in my age category that finished and that was the, the thing that he was most proud of you know was that he finished it but it was all the hard work that it took to show that he could get to that point. So yeah, I love that idea. So yes, and as I'm looking at the screen, we have another question that's coming in and we are we're starting to get short on time, but this one reads, I came across mindfulness as an extension of my yoga practice and have incorporated it into my fifth grade class. Uh, it has been amazing the results in my students' focus and in their grades as I am always looking for unique approaches to keep things fresh. Um, how does your uh, mind practice compare with mindfulness and is it something appropriate for my uh, fifth grade students? And this is from Allison in California. Yes, absolutely it is. And mindfulness, present moment functioning, we're all talking about um, learning to be where you're at. You know, and learning to be fully engaged in what you're doing. And, you know, I, I've worked with um, kids before, and one of the things that I've taught them to do is, you know, we did a thing uh, in, in one of the classes where I just said, okay, we're going to sit here for two minutes. I said, I want you to sit for two minutes and stop thinking. And just close your eyes, and just for two minutes, I'm going to time it so you don't have to worry about that. I'll tell you when the time's up. Well, it was amazing how amazed these kids were because when they came out of it they couldn't stop talking they were like I couldn't believe it I was in the cafeteria I was doing this I, I kept telling my mind stop thinking that and it wouldn't stop thinking it was like this epiphany for these kids that it was the first time as I said earlier it was the first time they realized that they weren't in control all the time and that they started to have this feeling of what it feels like to stop thinking so much and uh so they began meditating, and it made a tremendous difference in them. I mean, their grades went up, and there's actually a study. Uh, it was, I'm sure you can Google it. It was done in Baltimore in one of the problem schools, and it's been written about quite a bit. And they brought in meditation and, uh, mm -hmm. and mindfulness into there, and what they found was it completely transformed. This was a, you know, a, a high anxiety, high crime area, and these they ended up losing the detention center. They didn't, the kids weren't needing detentions. The kids were behaved. Their were grades were gone. All, this thing, all these things were happening. In fact, in Delaware here, there's a guy named Sam Beard who is making this, uh, he just created a nonprofit that is about bringing mind, making mindfulness study, the present moment functioning, which is basically what I call what I teach, into the schools. He said it should be just what we teach kids. And my daughter is a kindergarten teacher, and she has incorporated stuff from my book into her class and uh, with the five-year-olds. And it's worked. Uh, she said the kids, are they just love it. So I think that it's we really need to be working on this, especially because, as I said earlier, the, what they have found with these young, these young children is, you know, they've got cell phones and video games from the time they're little, and they just cannot stop their mind. And they, I think this is what, one of the reasons why this whole ADD thing is just going up and up and up because the mind is being stimulated stimulated, 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 and it's got so much inertia, so much momentum that uh, that it doesn't stop. Plus, they're at home with the parents that are being stimulated, so that it's the whole culture is just, the mind is overstimulated, and we're losing our ability. I mean, we know this. We're losing our ability to focus on anything for any length of time, and the studies, you know, they've, they started in sports when they were, you know, they have, we have all these ways of testing athletes. You know, we can put sensors on their bodies if they're a golfer or whatever and watch them swing and computer analyze it, and we know how physically to make someone fun function at the highest level. So then if you look at, in sports, if you look at something like golf, okay, if we can give this guy, make him have a perfect golf swing, then why can't he win every time? Why can't he hit the shot perfectly every time? Well, that's because it's the mind that controls the body. So that's the reason why this 
got so well funded because there's so much money at stake in the sport um, in the sporting world. It was okay. Okay, now we've we've pretty much peaked out on the physical thing. We know about nutrition and all that. So now we need to start working on the study in the mind, and that's been going on for decades. And what they have found is that when we are fully engaged, when we're functioning in the in the present moment, that's when we are functioning at our highest level. And that's what I found out when I started studying this stuff back when I was a senior in high school and into college. Was I initially started studying a lot of Eastern thought, and then I started studying sports psychology and peak performance, and that was when I realized there were two sides of the same coin. That what we were proving out in Western empirical science now was what had been around for thousands thousands of years and you know an amusing story about that is when I was uh, contacted by a Japanese um, publishing company wanting to put the practicing mind into Japanese what they told me was that what I was talking about in the practicing mind was a foundation of philosophy that had been around in their culture for thousands of years but that they had and they wanted to get back to it because they were so far away from it but because they had become so westernized they needed to hear it from from a western perspective in a western language in order for them to get it so I just thought that was really amusing well, yeah, and, and I understand that because they've gotten to the point now to where they, they needed to – the generation of people that are now listening needed to hear it in the same fashion in which they were accustomed to, be it you know, in, in English and by a Westerner. So I completely understand. Now, for everybody out there, um, please, if you want to get fully engaged um, or you just want to gather more information, go to TomSterner.com. Tom, thank you so much for being on. Uh, I, I look forward to, to staying in touch. I look forward to reading the book. And if you have anything else coming up, please feel free to contact us. We'd love to have you back anytime. Alan, I am, I'm so appreciative you know, to get a chance to talk to your audience and, and with you. Um, I will definitely keep in touch with you. You're certainly on the same page that I am. So thank you so much. You're welcome. And for everybody out there, be sure to put us on your calendar and tune in next Monday when we're joined by Brian Cooey, Director of Outpatient Services at the Hazleton Betty Ford Foundation, and Scott H. Silverman, author of Tell Me No, I Dare You, A Crisis in the Making. And please visit our archives of past interviews at AnswersForTheFamily.com. With over 400 shows, I'm confident you'll find something for you, your clients, your family, or your friends. And you may also subscribe or resubmit your name to download your free copy of the Attitude of Gratitude Journal, your 21-day guide to achieving the quality of thankfulness through self-discovery. And the next time you're on Facebook or Twitter, please remember to stop by our page, check out some of our latest posts, and if you like them, please like us and continue to spread the word. Be good humans and be with us again next week on Answers for the Family. You're listening to Answers for the Family with Alan Cardoza and Matt Polachek only on L.A. Talk Radio. 